Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Climate Lectures in 2022. Uh, we're climate at Max Baruts. We're a grassroots organization uh, trying to make life science more sustainable. And we also have um, a lecture series um, covering many topics, including uh, climate change research, but also how to make labs more uh, sustainable. And we're very happy today to have uh, Valerie Trouet from the University of um, Arizona. She's originally from Belgium and studied in uh, Ghent and then moved to uh, another university in Belgium, uh, Leuven, where she did her uh, PhD, uh, already working on, on climate change uh, then. Uh, she did two postdocs, one at the uh, ETH and one in uh, Penn State in the US. And then in 2011, she became a professor at the University of um, Arizona and is now, I think, a uh, a full professor uh, and um, next to, to her research she's also communicating science and and, um, um, and and a very active climate activist mostly I would say in our native country in Belgium but also uh, abroad uh, and she's also wrote in a book for a broader audience on how we can use science and her science uh, in particularly uh, which focuses on, on trees and tree rings uh, research uh, to explain uh, past events in, in the climate or, or climate and, and what we can learn from it. And this will also be the topic from, for today, uh, where she will um, explain her research uh, and show examples from past uh, climate events uh, and uh, uh, also what we can learn it for, for uh, the future. So Valerie, the stage is yours. Um, please share your slides. Uh, as always, we will have the talk first, so around 40 minutes. And then if people have questions at the end, you can add them in the chat uh, and I will read them out. Um, um, uh, so we hope to have an active uh, question session um, at the end. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this uh, very kind introduction and for the invite. I'm very honored um, to be here. Uh, let me make sure I got this. Can you all see my screen? Yes, um, perfect, yeah. Great, thank you. So um, thanks again for the invite. I'll be talking about dendrochronology, the science of uh, uh, studying the study of tree rings and how we use those tree rings to study the climate of the past, as well as some of its um, implications. So I'll start with um, a short introduction to dendrochronology so that I'm sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, dendrochronology comes from the Greek words dendron and chronos, so tree and time. What we do is we use the rings and trees to study time, to study the past. That can be human past and archaeology, um, the past of forests, so forest ecology, and then the past of the climate as well. And it gets really interesting when we combine these three factors into and study the interactions between them. Um, this being a Austria-based audience, primarily, I'm assuming, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that most people are familiar with what you're seeing here, the rings and trees. Um, many people in temperate regions will have looked at tree rings when they were kids and learned that you can count them to uh, get an estimate of the age of a tree. And the reason why we can do that is because trees again, in temperate regions, uh, form one ring each and every year. Uh, what fewer people know is that you can get a lot more information out of these trainings other than just counting them. And that's what uh, we'll talk about here. This is a microscopic close-up of a tree ring. So you can see a conifer here growing. Uh, so the center of the tree is to your left of the screen, the um, bark the outside of the tree is on, on the right. And you can see a number of tree rings here. So each tree ring consists of 
a light colored part, which is the early wood, and then a darker colored part, which is a late wood. As the name implies, the early wood is the wood that's formed in spring when the trees start growing. So in temperate regions, trees stop growing uh, in, in the winter time when it's too cold and too dark, and they start growing again in the spring. And so they start putting on new cells and the cells that they put on in the spring are, uh, as you can see, that they're big in, in surface and area, uh, and they have relatively thin cell walls. So it's important for trees in spring when they start growing leaves and photosynthesizing that they're able to transport a lot of water from the roots to their leaves. And that transport happens through these wood cells. And so it's important for those cells to have a big lumen earlier on in the spring. And that's what you see here. Later on in the growing season, towards summer, late summer and fall, that water transport function becomes less important. And what's more important is that the, um, the other function of the stem of a tree, the structural uh, part, the part that allows a stem to, to grow upward and to stand upright, that is an important function of wood as well. And so that function takes over towards uh, late summer. And you can see that the cells that are being formed are much smaller in, in size and the cell walls are relatively thicker. So there's more cell wall in the late wood than in the early wood. <clears throat> and visually, that uh, means that the early wood is often lighter colored than the late wood. What happens then at the end of summer <clears throat> in fall, the tree stops growing altogether. There's a winter dormancy period. And then the next spring, it starts growing again. But the cells that it forms the next spring are very different from the cells that it has formed in the previous fall. And so that the, the tree ring boundaries that you see, I'll go back um, to the previous slide if I can. Well, the, the tree ring boundaries that you see, that's actually the transition between the late wood of one ring and then the early wood of the next ring. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay, sorry about that. So one important thing um, that I always have to remind myself uh, to, to say when I, when I give presentations like this is that in order to do our science, we don't need to cut down trees to see the rings. Um, if we had to do that, it would be very limited in what we can do if we had to cut down every living tree to study its rings. So our main tool is what you see here, it's a hollow core um, with which we, core into the tree, this mostly happens by hand. So you core into the tree um, and then you extract the pencil sized core out of the tree. So that goes from the bark all the way to the center of the tree. Um, these cores, um, we typically take two or three from each tree, anywhere between 10 and 50 trees uh, per site, depending on what the purpose of, of your study is. And then we bring them all back to the lab. And then in the lab, what we do is you, you sand them up nicely. So these are all in the individual cores that you see. You, they're mounted in, in a core holder. And then you sand them up finely. And when you sand them, that's when the tree ring structures really come out. Um, and then, once we've done that, we measure the tree rings, and then it's a question of pattern matching. So the whole concept of Denver chronology, um, the primary concept is called cross dating. It's, it's matching the patterns that you see in the rings between different trees um, to date them. So we've, I've, I've talked about how tree rings are being formed, how we extract information from them is that not all tree rings are the same. I mean, you can, you can see that here in this example, some rings are very narrow, some rings are very wide. Sometimes there's a, there, there are anomalies in the wood as well and so forth. And so these patterns of narrow and wide rings on the one hand allow us to combine samples into 
to extract more information. On the other hand, they tell us something about the environment in which the tree grew. And that's where we extract our information out of. <clears throat> What's important to know, I already mentioned that um, there's also applications in, in archaeology uh, in, in our field, is that we're not limited to working with living trees alone. These patterns of narrow and, and wide rings, they um, are preserved in the wood, also of historical buildings, of um, even of wood that has been um, so what we call subfossil wood. So wood that has been preserved in bogs or in rivers, sometimes for 10,000 years or more. That, that ring structure is preserved in the wood. And so you can use the rings also of trees that have died, of um, art, historical pieces that have been made out of wood, out of buildings that have been made out of wood and so forth. And so putting sorry, all of these um, pieces of wood together, starting with the living trees for which you know the date when the the sample was taken, going further back in time with dead trees, with historical buildings, with archaeology, and then the oldest part with subfossil wood. The longest continuous streaming chronology that we've been able to put together so far um, is the German oak and, and pine chronology, and it's more than 12,650 um, years long. So it's continu uh, continuous chronology, meaning that for each of those 12,650 years, we have one data point. We have one ring for each of those, of those years. Obviously, that's not based on one tree. It's based on a large collection of samples. <clears throat> I should mention, even though the longest continuous chronology is more than 12,000 years long, so it reaches back uh, to the, the early Holocene, um, we're not able to use all of that information, all of those 12,000 years for climate reconstruction. For climate reconstruction, I won't go into detail, but there's a lot of statistical analysis that comes into play. You also need to know exactly where your samples came from. You need to know um, you need to have enough sample replication and so forth. So, so for climate reconstruction, treating-based climate reconstruction, we mostly focus on the past 2,000 years. So before I go into detail about how we uh, and, and what we found out from treatings about past climate, it's, it's important to think about why we study the history of climate in the first place. And I'm going to say there's two, very broadly, two main reasons to do that. The first one is that it's important to study how climate changes in a natural way. So we know that since the start of the Industrial Revolution, about 150 years ago, since we've started emitting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we have been changing our climate. Um, so anthropogenic climate variability and climate change. Um, that doesn't mean that natural climate variability just goes away. There are um, still factors, natural factors um, of climate that are, can, can enhance um, or temper anthropogenic climate change. And so to, it's important to understand how um, the climate changes um, from other factors than anthropogenic factors. And so because we've started influencing our climate, uh, let's say around 1850, that's about the same time that we started measuring our climate. So if you think of meteorological stations of thermometers, pluviometers, they've been installed worldwide uh, roughly since the start of the 20th century. So using only instrumental measurements, we only have a record of a climate that is influenced by us, right? So we don't have a record, an instrumental record of what the climate without anthropogenic influence uh, is like. So if we wanna study natural climate variability, we need to go further back in time than our instrumental period. 
we'll very quickly talk. Uh, there's three main, there's, there's internal climate variability. The climate is a chaotic system. Uh, it, it creates uh, variability in and of itself, but there are also external drivers, non-anthropogenic drivers uh, of climate change. And there's three main ones. The first one is changes in the orbit of the earth around the sun. Uh, you know that we you know that orbit is is elliptical, but it's not always equally. The ellipse is not always equally uh, the, or the same shape. There's slight changes in the tilt uh, of the Earth towards the sun and so forth. These changes work on really um, long time scales. We're talking between twenty thousand and hundred thousand years. These are orbital changes. Is what uh, creates ice ages. <clears throat> The second uh, driver of natural climate variability is uh, changes in the amount of energy that the sun uh, sends out. So we know that our main source of energy in the Earth is, is energy coming from the sun. That amount is not a constant, constant over time. So there's changes in how much energy the sun sends as well. The third factor and so, sorry, those changes in the amount of um, solar energy um, can, they're, they're not on the very long time scales as orbital changes, they're more on the decadal to centennial time scales. The third factor um, is big volcanic eruptions. Um, when, especially tropical volcanoes, as we've just uh, uh, witnessed happening in Tonga uh, a week ago, when these big volcanoes erupt, they spew uh, aerosols and sulfur into the, the atmosphere. And if they're very large, even up into the stratosphere. And so when those aerosols reach the stratosphere due to the atmospheric circulation, it creates, they can create a veal um, that a veil, sorry, <laughs> that kind of covers the earth and, and uh, reflects some of the sunlight uh, that gives us energy. So when these, uh, for a couple of years following very big volcanic eruptions, the earth's temperature can actually cool down for anywhere between one and, and five years. So those are the three main uh, natural drivers of climate change that we know of. Um, the second reason to study uh, climate of the past is to better understand what we're dealing with now, to better understand how exceptional uh, our current uh, climate is and to maybe find analogs in the past. So to provide a long-term perspective on the climate change that we're experiencing now. This is a, a really good example of what we can learn uh, from different proxies. So proxies are geological or biological archives to study the climate of the past. These are not tree rings. These are ice cores from Antarctica. And I'll, I'll show quite a few of those wiggly lines throughout um, my presentation. So I'll, maybe started by, by saying that all of, all of these are time series. So time is on the horizontal axis. In this case, as I mentioned, this is from Antarctic ice cores. The present is always gonna be on the right. And then in this case, these are time series that go back 800,000 years. So much further back in time than, than tree ring data. <clears throat> on the top graph, you can see the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over the past 800,000 years. And you can see that it roughly varies uh, between 200 and 300 parts per million. Um, they, the, the way they do that is so, so you, you core in the ice, the deeper down you go, the further back in time you go. And then actually the CO2 is being kept in, in air bubbles in the ice. And so you can, when, when you melt the ice, you can measure how much CO2 was um, in those air bubbles um, as you go further back in time. Um, 
the bottom uh, graph is now a different uh, isotope that's measured in those ice cores, and that's uh, a proxy for temperature variability. So the Earth's temperature, and what you can see is that uh, whenever CO2 in the atmosphere went up, your temperature goes up. Whenever your CO2 went down, your temperature goes down, and so forth. So these are very um, uh, slow changes in uh, the Earth's temperature and the Earth's uh, CO2 uh, concentration in the Earth's atmosphere. And these slow changes, um, the, the, the warm and cold temperatures that you see here, these are actually the ice ages that I was talking about before. So um, cold uh, ice ages followed by a warm interglacial cold ice age again and so forth. <clears throat> Importantly, in terms of CO2, I want you to look at the absolute numbers here. So over the past 800,000 years, um, CO2 in the atmosphere has varied between 200 and 300 uh, ppm. When I give live presentations, this is the point where I ask, does anyone know how much CO2 is in the atmosphere at the moment? Um, here, I'll just give uh, give the number but so today we're at 418 parts per million uh, co2 in the atmosphere and so if you put that on the graph that i was showing earlier we are way outside of the range of natural co2 um, variability at least over the past 800,000 years so we wouldn't know just how extraordinary our current circumstances are if it weren't for uh, uh, studying the climate of the past. As I mentioned, with tree rings, we're much more limited in time. At best, 2,000, 2,500 years is, is a very good reconstruction. But what is important is those are the time scales that are relevant for policy. And also, those are the time scales of the past 2000 years is the period that we know most about human history. So we can start linking what we know about climate history to what we know about human history. The, probably the most uh, famous string based example of climate reconstruction and uh, an example of how putting, how looking um, in the past helps to put our current circumstances in a longer term context is, is this graph. It's called the hockey stick graph uh, for a reason. It was published in 1999. Um, and basically this shows the temperature in the Northern hemisphere, average temperature in Northern hemisphere from a thousand years ago up until now. And by now, I mean 1998, the, the most recent year before this paper was published. And it's called a hockey stick because you can see that the over the past from 1000 to 1850 temperatures are um, cooling ever so slightly. That is what, what you're seeing. This very slight cooling is, is us going very slowly going towards an ice age uh, in, in the distant future. But then we see that from 1900 onwards, there's actually, there's a blade of the hockey stick. There's actually a very um, uh, distinct change um, in the uh, in temperatures. There's a very distinct and sudden increase in Northern hemisphere temperature. And so the big storyline of this paper, again, published in 99, is that 1998 was the warmest year on record of past 1000 years. And that created uh, a, a big stir, uh, especially, you know, this is now 20 years ago at the time of, of very heavy climate denial, political climate denial as well. Um, my colleagues uh, who published this paper got attacked from all angles by climate deniers trying to uh, find fault in their methodology so that they you know, to, to disprove that this was actually uh, the case. By now, we're, we're more than 20 years later, and this controversy is a little outdated uh, because 1999, sorry, 1998 is 
by far no longer the longest year uh, over the past 1000 years. <clears throat> We've had at least nine warmer years since then. But just to give you an idea of, of what, um, what we can do with, with tree rings to study the climate of the past. <clears throat> One important concept when using the rings and trees to reconstruct the climate of the past, there's, there's various aspects of the climate that we can uh, reconstruct. One of them is temperature, as I showed earlier. Uh, the other one is, is water availability of, or drought. And so one important concept is that if we, we don't use the same trees to reconstruct boat or to study boats, uh, as a rule of thumb, if we want to reconstruct temperature, we go to cold regions where the tree growth is limited by how warm or how cold the summers are. So this can be the Austria, for instance, beautiful temperature reconstructions uh, based on, on trees in Austria, Scandinavia, Alaska, Siberia, basically high latitude or high elevation um, regions. We want to study uh, drought. On the other hand, uh, we go to a dry climate, such as here in, in the American Southwest, where I grow, uh, or the, the European Mediterranean, or in this example, um, the California Central Valley. The tree that you see on your left is a blue oak. On the right, you see the distribution of, of where uh, blue oaks were sampled for this study. And so these are some of the most drought sensitive trees that I've ever worked with. There's not a dry year in California that goes by or the blue oaks form a narrow ring. They, they really are extremely, their growth is really extremely strongly limited by how much water is available to them. <clears throat> Um, we use those uh, blue oaks and their tree rings to reconstruct the amount of snowpack. I'll go back one slide. Oh. To reconstruct the amount of snowpack that's available in the Sierra Nevada in California. So I, I don't know if any of you have been in California, but it's a bit like in Europe. It's a, a Mediterranean climate, meaning that California gets all of its precipitation in winter. It's a winter precipitation climate. So in summer, there's almost no rainfall. Um, and that makes the, the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada here on the east of California is really important because snow is a way to store that winter precipitation um, and then make it available in the spring um, when the snow melts, it means that California can still have water in summer, even if there's no rainfall, there's snow melt. So it's a natural storage system uh, of, of water in this, in this Mediterranean climate. Now, I, from 2012 to 2016, California was in a very severe drought. And in 2015, in April 2015, there was the, the newspaper headlines that the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada had was the lowest it had been in 80 years since they started measuring snowpack. Uh, and when my team and I, when we heard that news on the radio, you know, lowest snowpack in 80 years, we realized, I think we, we think we can do better than that in terms of putting this in a longer context than 80 years. And so that's where we use the blue oak tree rings to reconstruct the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada now over the past 500 years. And that's the time series that you see in red is the instrumental record in black is the reconstruction. And the horizontal dashed red line is the snowpack in 2015. And so the, what came out of our research is that the snowpack in 2015 was not only the lowest in the past 80 years, but the lowest in the past 500 years. And we were a bit overwhelmed by the media attention that that result 
uh, uh, got to. So in a way, we just we we developed our own drought hockey stick for California. Excuse me. Um, and really everyone jumped on it. CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, everyone all of a sudden was, was saying, you know, was talking about a 500 year uh, California snowpack low. Um, as a scientist, and, and this paper was led by Sumaya Belmeshri, uh, a postdoc in my lab at the time, this is of course very exciting to experience, it's also, you also realize just how dire of a message it is, right? I mean, it's California and it's, it's in a 500 year drought. Um, but it did make us, it did really sink in after getting this media attention is that we have the expertise to really contribute to this giant problem that we're dealing with, this climate change issue. We as streaming scientists have the expertise to answer some of the unknown unknowns around climate change. And so after that experience with the snowpack drought, um, it, it, it kind of changed my thinking of how about to, how to go about my science a little bit, going from, not from what can I do with these streamings, but what are the big issues in climate change science that um, our training research can help solve. So, so starting from the questions that need solving and then seeing whether we can contribute to that solution. And I'll talk about two, I hope I, I'll have time. I'll, 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 well, anyway, I'll talk about two examples about uh, around that. The first one is the variability in the jet stream. Um, and the second one is uh, fire history in California. Um, and so in climate science uh, and the climate science community, there is a lot of discussion about what is happening to the jet stream. So there are some aspects of anthropogenic climate change that we understand quite well, you know, the thermodynamical aspects. We know that if you increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, it's gonna get warmer. It's pretty, you know, that's a pretty straightforward relationship. How much warmer it's going to get depends on how much CO2 we're going to put into the atmosphere. There's other aspects of the climate system, however, such as the jet stream that we understand much less well, and we don't really know what's going to happen to the jet stream in the future, or the models and the data uh, disagree. And so, the jet stream are the winds that blow at very high elevation at the tropopause, so at the um, border between the troposphere and the atmosphere, kind of the elevation that airplanes fly. And they move around the uh, northern hemisphere as well as the southern hemisphere in eastward direction. So the jet stream is the reason why if you fly from the US to Europe, you know, you can do that in about seven hours because you have the jet stream with you. If you fly in the other direction, um, it takes you about nine hours because you have to fly against the wind, basically. So, so there are the high elevation winds that blow eastwards across the northern hemisphere. Discussion is whether <clears throat> what we're seeing in recent years <clears throat> is that the jet stream is getting wavier as you can see here. So, I mean, this is, this is a, an image, but rather than going in a straight line, the jet stream is starting to meander more and more. And why this is important is because the, those winds high up in the atmosphere, they orchestrate the climate that happens at the Earth's surface. So you can think of the jet stream as um, the border between cold air from the polar region and warm air from the tropical region. So you can think of the region south of the jet stream being warm and the regions north of the jet stream being cold. Now, if the jet stream starts to meander, um, so here, for instance, this warm air is going to come much further north than normal and you're going to get heat waves. Whereas in this other region, it's, it's the jet stream is further south than normal and you're gonna get a cold spell, so cold air coming much further south than normal. So the, the position and the waviness of the jet stream 
creates extremes in a climate, floods, heat waves, cold spells, and so forth. And we've seen, been seeing more and more of those in recent decades. So the question now is, we've, we've seen that the jet stream is getting wavier. Is this related to anthropogenic climate change? And are we, can we expect more of this in the future? And there, the scientific community does not agree. There's some people who say, yes, this waviness of the jet stream is connected to Arctic amplification, so to the, the faster warming of the Arctic uh, compared to tropical regions. But again, not all models and not all data support that. And part of why there is disagreement about it is that the time series that they're working with are very short. So the best way to study this jet stream, remember this is about 10 kilometers above the Earth system, is with satellites. But we've only been, you know, the, the satellites best case scenario have been up, up there since the early 1980s. So we only have about 40 years of, of actual jet stream measurements, and that's not enough to look at trends um, or to look at, you know, long-term variability. So that's where we come in with our trainings. And specifically, we are interested, we were interested to see whether we could use the rings and trees to reconstruct the position of the jet stream and the waviness of the jet stream over Europe. Um, to sketch uh, the general settings in a normal year, and we're talking about summer now, in a normal year, the jet stream is positioned um, just north of uh, Scotland. Um, so over the North Atlantic, just north of Scotland. And so the cold polar air stays north of Scotland and the summers uh, in Northwestern Europe are, are nice and warm. In years when the jet stream is positioned further south than normal, as you can see here, as was the case in 2012, the cool polar air comes much further south than normal. And so you get really cold and uh, uh, rainy summers in Northwestern Europe. Um, and this is actually how I came up with the idea or the, the idea to, to use strings to reconstruct the jet stream. As you can see, the jet stream is positioned right over in Belgium here. And in the summer of 2012, I was visiting my parents in Belgium. And um, as, as Jeroen can uh, attest, the summers in Belgium are rarely nice and sunny. They're, they're often kind of rainy and gray, but that summer it was just, it was just ridiculously bad. Even for Belgian weather, it was just gray and rainy nonstop. And so everyone was talking about this being the jet stream causing that, and that's where, where the idea came from. Anyway, the, the other, um, so, so cool air uh, coming over the British Isles and Western Europe, further south than normal, the, the, the warm tropical air in southeastern Europe is, is almost kind of, it's like it's condensed in a smaller space. And so you get the opposite, you get heat waves um, and, and dry conditions over the Balkans and Italy. And, so, and the opposite happens when a jet stream is positioned further north than normal, then the warm air um, from the tropics comes further north than normal. And so you get uh, heat waves in, in the British Islands. So what the position of the jet stream does over Europe is that it creates, in summer, it creates a temperature dipole. So a contrasting conditions between Northwestern Europe and Southeastern Europe, so the Balkans and Italy. This is a correlation map. So it shows the correlations between that position of the jet stream that I was talking about and temperatures in uh, the British Isles and in the Balkans. And so you can see that they're opposite anti-correlated with each other. So our idea was if we take tree rings from these two regions, can we uh, reconstruct uh, the jet stream? Uh, if we combine uh, tree rings from these two opposite uh, regions. So we did that and we did, um, Com we combined trees from those two regions. In red is the actual position of the jet stream uh, in measured by instruments. In blue is our reconstruction. And indeed, 
by combining tree rings from those two regions, we can explain about 40% of the variance in the instrumental um, jet stream variability. And that means we can reconstruct jet stream variability back in time. This is our reconstruction. Um, so we were, were this is, this was a preliminary paper. It's a almost 300 year reconstruction. We find that indeed, actually the average position of the jet stream hasn't changed much over those 300 years, but the variance, the variability around the average has, that's the bottom graph you see here has increased. So that is in line with what we're seeing in the instrumental period that the jet stream has become more wavier. So there's more variability around that mean. And so, uh, with our treating data, we can't, we're not in a position to say whether this is caused by anthropogenic climate change or whether what's going to happen in the future. But we can say that this recent increase in variance and increasing waviness is unprecedented over the past 300 years. As I mentioned, this is work in progress. We're now working on an 800 year long reconstruction. Um, to do that, we went back to the Balkans. Um, or I and my team, we went back to the Balkans. We were very lucky to be to be working there. It's a, a gorgeous place to work. Beautiful old old trees. Um, went to Greece, Bulgaria, and so forth. Beautiful landscapes, good food, and so forth. Um, to get older trees from the British Isles. Uh, my colleagues were, were, I mean, I collaborated with colleagues from uh, Edinburgh, uh, St. Saint, Saint Andrews University in Scotland. Um, they were less lucky. Um, beautiful landscapes as well, but not many old trees left in, in Scotland at all. Um, so if you want to go back 500, 800, 800, 1,000 years, you have to go find these logs that are preserved in the lakes in Scotland. Um, so here you see my colleague Rob Wilson sampling uh, a log that they dredged out of the lake first, um, and then you saw a piece of it, and then you cross dated in the hopes that somehow it's anywhere between 500 and 1000 years long. So um, even in summer, these, I, I did go and do field work in Scotland one summer, it's, it's so cold. And then to, to be digging in these lakes for, <laughs> for hours every day, it was, I'd much rather go uh, and court trees in Greece. Um, and in Greece, we did find uh, the oldest uh, dendrochronologically dated living tree in Europe. It's a Bosnian pine. And uh, in 2015, when we recorded, it was 1,075 years old. Um, and this is, these are very preliminary results. Um, this is, so we, using the same idea, we've been able now to reconstruct the position of the jet uh, back 800 years instead of 300 years. Um, I know, um, running out of time. I'll just, I'll, I'll say a few words about California and fire history. I'm sorry to uh, running late. So in uh, back to California, there's an increase in, and we, you know, we just heard that there's a fire now in, in January in California, Big Sur, very big fire. So there's an increase in how much um, fires are burning in California. This is a time series since uh, 1972. So about the last past 50 years. And so you can see the number of area burned by fire has, has increased about fivefold over the past 50 years. Um, if you model this, um, you can obviously this is related to to warming temperatures right so warming temperatures make the uh make for more drought as we as i've discussed earlier make the vegetation much drier and so higher fire risk it also prolongs the fire season the season in which it's hot and dry um as i mentioned now there's fires in january now so Anthropogenic climate change definitely plays a role in this increase in wildfire in California. Um, but if you model the increase in wildfire um, using 
anthropogenic climate change, you cannot explain, you, you do get an increase in, in wildfire, but not as much as we're seeing. So you cannot explain a really, really five-fold increase in wildfire with climate change alone. So there's something else happening. There's more to the story than climate change alone. And that's where also there with our trainings, we can come in and study what was the fire situation in California like in the past. So it's a very different way of studying um, tree rings. Uh, for this kind of work, you, you, you can't really use uh, uh, cores and cores. You do need to cut wedges out of, out of the trees. And basically the idea is when a ground fire, so a fire that stays low to the ground, when it hits a forest, it typically burns off the underbrush, it burns off the, um, the understory, the grasses, the shrubs and so forth, but it typically does not kill the big trees. Those fires don't get intense enough and don't get big enough to kill the mature trees, but they might, damage the mature trees. And so all over the forest in, in California and the American West, you can find these kind of trees that have been damaged by consecutive ground fires. So they haven't been killed, they survived, um, but they uh, have been damaged by, by individual ground fires. And so each of these layers that you see here, this stump, uh, this is a stump of a tree that has two big series of uh, fire scars in it, but each of these layers that you see here represents an individual fire. And so when you cut through this with a chainsaw, um, this is what you get. And so you can see these fire scars on the surface of, of your uh, cookie. Um, and then using that's where the trees come in. Using uh, tree ring dating, you can date when each of these fires occurred, the exact year, in some cases, even the season when these fires occurred. And so um, you can get a very good idea of how frequently fires burned in the past, what years they burned in the past, what seasons they burned, and so forth. Um, this is a similar example. You can put an exact date to each of those fire scars. And so this is the work I did at Penn State uh, in my first postdoc. Obviously, this kind of work you don't do based on you know, one sample from one tree. We collected about 2,000 samples from 30 sites, dated just under 20,000 fire scars. And if you put all of that together, this is what you get. You get a massive chronology, so again, time on the axis is of which were the big fire years in California. And you can get an idea of what, what's happening. Now, I, I realize I'm keeping you dangling, but I'm gonna stop here. Um, you, can, you can read the paper if you're interested in how this answers some of the questions um, about what's happening to wildfires in California now. Um, In conclusion, um, trees can inform us about um, the past, obviously, but also the present and future of, of climate. I've shown that, of ecosystems, I've shown that. I haven't really talked about human systems much, um, but also importantly, how the three of them are linked. And with that, I'd like to thank my, my research group and, and my collaborators. This is obviously not work from, from me alone. Um, and then this is the, if you, if you want to, uh, if you, you're interested in the topic, I did write a um, broad audience book on this topic. It's published by Johns Hopkins University. You can find it on Amazon and uh, in your local bookstore, hopefully. Um, it's called Tree Story, History of the World Written in Rings. It's also been translated in a few other languages. The Italian version is coming out at the end of the month. Um, no German version so far, unfortunately. But um, with this, I thank you for your attention as well, and I'll stop sharing here. All right, thank you, Valerie. Thanks for a detailed talk on, on a topic I, I knew very little of, uh, about before, but thanks a lot.
If people have questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, we we'll have another 10 minutes for, for questions um, um, for Valerie. Uh, I'll start off with one when people are typing is, is uh, I guess, the example of, of the UK, but also Austria or other countries is, I mean, forestry is not native or very few native trees anymore. How does that influence your, I mean, I guess it's, it's probably quite difficult by now to find the native trees. And, and um, the second question would be that if people put them in plantations or whatever, does that really influence a lot? The, 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 is this good for you or, or bad for you that, that they probably become all the same or very similar to tree rings? Yeah, so it depends, of course, uh, a, a nice question, thank you. It depends, of course, what the goal of your study is. Um, for for climate for trading-based climate reconstruction, we're really interested in, in two things primarily. One, how old are the trees? How far back can we go in time? So plantation trees, you know, we're not, uh, they, they can be very interesting for other uh uh, purposes, but for climate reconstruction, we, we want to go to old trees, and you're right, those are often the, the native trees. Um, so how old are they and how sensitive are they to climate? So I was talking about those blue oaks are very sensitive to drought. Uh, trees high up in the Austrian Alps are going to be very sensitive to, and there's there's slight variation between species, but but that's not between tree species, but but that's less important than um, than where they're growing and how and how sensitive they are to, to climate. But, but what is happening now is as the climate is warming, trees are getting, uh, and that's a, a big topic of research, trees are getting less sensitive uh, to, to cold summers because there are less cold summers. Um, so how do we, how do you deal with that? Has that, has that happened in the past and so forth? So yeah, you're, you're touching on an active field of research there. Okay, there's uh, two more questions in the chat. One is from Saroy, who's joining us from Oxford, actually. So we have a, a little bit of a uh, international audience. So thanks for the great talk. And he wanted to know if you take the tree sample, uh, will it harm the tree and, and how will it get repaired? I guess you touched on it a little bit in the beginning. Yeah, it, it does not harm the tree. Um, and the... the so there have been some um, experiments with it, with plugging, uh, you know, when you plugging the hole that, that you um, extract the core out of, but that actually turns out makes things worse because you create a, it's, it's, it's like with, when you, when you have a wound, you got to let it breed. It's the same with, with a tree, you got to give it air to, to breed basically. But, but the way to think of it is that, um, Everything that's wood is actually dead material. There's there's nothing living there. The only living part of a trunk of a tree is a very narrow layer, the cambium layer between the bark and the wood. Um, and that's where the tree forms new cells and where it grows. So that's the only living part. So when you take a core and your core is about um, a half a centimeter in diameter, the vast majority of material that you extract is dead. The only, the only taking like a half a centimeter of, of living material um, from, from the tree. Um, and so it's, it's really a lot like, like drawing blood from a person. It'll, it, it won't have lasting damage. There's not enough, there's not enough material there. Um, okay, and, and get, does it get repaired by the tree or does it? Get again, uh, or over the, time, or trees can't heal. So this is, is the same idea as with um as with the fire card. So trees cannot heal. They can't repair. Uh, again, it's dead material. They can't. They have nothing to repair it with. What they do is they grow over it. So so the cambium grows over it over time, and then it does close off. Uh, yeah. Okay. Then we have two more questions on the jet stream. Um, I'm trying to combine them. What is it? So from Sophie, what's exactly what you measure with within the trees and or the wood in order to assess the waviness of the jet stream? And the second question is what what makes the jet stream become more wavier? I think this is probably the open for discussion, but 
Yeah, that's it. so. The second question is exactly what. Um, well, I'll, uh, well, maybe I'll start with the second question. The theory, the hypothesis is. So I mentioned that the jet stream is the can be considered as the border between a cool Arctic air and a warm um, tropical air in the northern hemisphere. With anthropogenic climate warming, the Arctic is warming faster than the tropics. So the, the tropics aren't warming as fast as, as the Arctic. And so the, um, the, the gradient between um, the Arctic and the tropics, the Arctic temperature and tropical temperature is getting less steep. There's less of a difference between the two. And it's actually that difference that drives the speed uh, of the jet stream. So when the difference, when there's a lot of difference between the two, you get a jet stream that's nice and uh, fast um, and not wavy. When the difference diminishes, you can think of it like the slope of a, of a river. You can think of the gradient as, as the slope of a river. So, so when, the, when the gradient is steep, the river is going to go straight, right? Fast and straight. When the gradient, when you're in a delta and the gradient is less steep, you're going to get a river that slows down and then meanders a lot. And so that's what's that's a theory of what's happening to the jet stream as the process of Arctic amplification. So the, the warmer, the, the faster warming of the Arctic compared to the tropics, um, that is what's driving the, the waviness that we're experiencing. But but there is controversy around it, as I mentioned, not all models and data sets agree that that's, that that's what's causing it. Um, as to the second question, um, if you don't mind, I'll share my screen again, because I actually um, skipped over it, how I was going to explain it for time reasons. But um, so the idea is that the jet stream, obviously, with trimmings, we cannot measure. We can the trimmings do not record directly what's happening ten kilometers above the atmosphere. But what's happening with the jet stream is influencing the climate at the Earth's surface, the temperatures at the Earth's surface, and those temperatures at the same time are influencing tree growth at the Earth's surface. And so, if you take uh, tree growth from these two regions, tree ring data from these two regions. Really, the only mechanism that causes this, this contrasting um, climate between these two regions is the jet stream. And so if you combine tree ring data that are climate sensitive from these two regions, you can indirectly get at the jet stream. And so I haven't talked about this in much detail, but when you want to reconstruct temperature from a region like the Balkans, um, we don't, you get a better representation of temperature when you measure the density of the wood than when you just measure the width of the rings. And so for these, for this reconstruction, we've actually measured the variation in density of the late wood from year to year, getting a bit technical, but basically when you measure density, what you're measuring is how thick the cell walls are um, from year to year. Uh, how, how the thickness of the cell wall changes from year to year. And so when you think of it, we're linking these measurements really at the subcellular scale to these patterns that are happening on the hemispheric scales, 10 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it works, right? Um, you, the, the blue or the, the condensation of, of the density measurements, the red is a measurements of, of the jet stream, so. All right, so if there's no more questions, I wanna thank Valerie for joining us today and for the great talk.